Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends. Steve Longo is produced, performed, and recorded with several well-known artists, including Leslie West of Mountain, Cream Bassist Jack Bruce, Eddie Money, Alan Parsons, Todd Rundgren, Hearts Ann Wilson, Richie Blackmore, Mark Farner, Joe Walsh, Billy Squire, and many, many more. The most prolific and significant of all his work was with John N. Whistle, best known for his iconic bass guitarist for The Who. The two musicians became the best of friends. Longo produced, performed, co-wrote, and toured with the John N. Whistle band until N. Whistle's death in 2002. Their last live performance together was in Japan during the A Walk Down Abbey Road Tour. Later that year, he was invited by The Who and N. Whistle's family to write and read the eulogy at N. Whistle's memorial service in London. In 2007, Longo served as producer and composer for a studio band he created with ACDC bassist Cliff Williams, in which Williams recruited frontman and Sarasota native Brian Johnson as the vocalist. The project, later known as Forklift, gave birth to seven tracks. Chain Gang on the Road was the only track offered by the quartet, was briefly available for free download during a run of U.S. tour dates in 2007. In 2012, Longo began a musical partnership with Cheap Trick uh, vocalist Robin Zander by forming the Robin Zander Band. Zander was among the first to be asked to appear in Longo's documentary film in Ox's Tale, the John Entwistle story about the late John Entwistle. Uh, Longo is also an incredible artist and fashion designer, and we'll talk about more of that as well. Please welcome drummer, singer, songwriter, record producer, artist, and fashion designer, Steve Longo, to Interviewing the Legends. Hello, Steve. Uh, hello, Ray. Thanks very much. That was uh, quite an intro. Thank you very much. And I had to cut it down. <laughs> well, it's been a long time. <laughs> it's been a long time, a long yeah. <laughs> now, you live in Fort Myers? I do. I, I do. I moved to Florida about 18 years ago yep. and never looked back. I actually moved here with my wife for mm-hmm. a dog. We had a dog who needed to swim every day. Lori and I vacationed on Sanibel. Right. Loved it. He was kind of outliving his back legs. Vet said, hey, get, like, have him swim every day. December in New York, not so easy. Exactly. Florida. And we loved it. So we were, we were put, staying put. It's funny because I moved, I'm in Bradenton, actually. Now? Yeah, I I moved here about 20 years ago from DC. Wow. So we have a similar story there. All right, I got to ask you, man, how did you do with uh, Ian? I mean, we're lucky. Bradenton, Sarasota, and Tampa are all, for the last 100 years, we've been lucky, but you guys always get crushed, especially Sanibel Island. And that man, let me tell you the weird part about that. Sanibel is where we used to come. And, you know, they never mind the dogs on the beach. That's where we used to come after every tour. We'd drive down, just quiet, no music, no nothing, dog in the back. And um, I thought when when Lori said, well, we should move down there, I thought that's where I had to live. I I have to live on Sanibel. And the... That would have been a huge mistake for a number of reasons, um, none the least of which is the traffic. But this, I'm wary about beach houses and always have right right. so where i am in fort myers i'm um just across 41 Mm -hmm. you know uh almost parallel with uh pine island so we don't have the storm surge thing you know we got wind up the wazoo and it was interesting because for the first the thing sat over us for Mm -hmm. hours Mm -hmm. so for the first hours that it came through the winds were us you know because of the circular motion were out of the north going south no problem no damage little tree here there but when it finally got up and was coming out of the north out of the south to the north it took part of the roof the um really shingles oh yeah because of the way the way the property set up there's like a lot of foliage and stuff to break the wind on different sides but the south side is open just wide open. So it took my solar panels, but you know, nothing that can't be replaced, nothing that makes my quality of life inside the home any less. So how did I make out? I made out 
like the one percent of the one percent right i am as grateful as i could be because it really was a scary thing to go through and i've been through three or four of them we all have yeah me too yeah uh, how about you do you, you have a lanai right how did the lanai stand up 50 feet with a, it stood up itself the, right. the frame is fine and it's a substantial frame but the right. some of the panels and I, I tell you a funny thing the some of the panels just got blown out well no big deal as long as the the structure and right. you know, a storm with winds 150 mile an hour probably better if the screens blow out <laughs> exactly you don't want to so the screens are blown out off the top and I, i'm standing there and we have an overhang out by the lanai right and all of a sudden I, it looked like batman was coming out of the out of the sky one of my solar panels came right through perfectly missed all sides of the cage and wow. smashed into the pool I, I wish i had it on film i don't have a security camera there it was amazing huh. <laughs> yeah so. did you guys lose power well uh, we lost power for a week but you know this is not our first rodeo so we right. have the plan you know what i mean we have the the generator right and enough extension cords or whatever else and we call it glamping the only mm -hmm. thing that we don't get is you know the internet and cable so we have mm -hmm. to uh you know play some games there we, we didn't lose power the uh the ongoing uh thing here in this area and they say Bradenton, sarasota tampa is that the indians the american indian bless the land and that's why we don't get any storms so man very I, cool <laughs> i hope that, i hope that's true yeah um, you know you have a couple of neighbors uh, 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 that are friends uh, is rick derringer still in bradenton i think yeah i think rick also has a house on the west coast as well i mean west coast of florida mm -hmm. and i'm not sure if he still has that house or not but he was and uh you know brian brian johnson and bird key bird key yeah, yeah. i spent a week there one night <laughs> doesn't uh um Xander doesn't he have a place around here too he's up in the Tampa uh, Safety Harbor I think. okay and Joe Perry lives around here too he's got a place oh, here I think Joe has and this be interesting to know I think he has um the, a place out on Captiva which oh, Captiva okay uh, if it's I know it's either him can't remember which member of the band is but I think it's Joe has has a house right. on because it's called it's called like sweet emotion or something like that really uh yeah it's one of the houses that you have to give a name on the sign out by the street right right so and Mick Jagger's girlfriend has a a house right here in Lakewood Ranch that's it, it, it's beautiful yeah. there man it's beautiful it's, it is nice we live in a beautiful part of the world and the truth of the matter is the solidarity that everybody has in yep. these in these storms mm -hmm. you know fort myers beach just got that, that i know i saw it unbelievable sanibel still yeah. kind of looks like sanibel and they fixed the bridge in what a week yeah like fort myers beach i mean it's i saw it for i was surprised i was really surprised yeah yeah Stunning. Well, perfect storm and you know they say and we'll get out of the hurricane in a second <laughs> they say that that no matter what you see on the news or right picture, until you're sitting there the exactly the dynamic uh impression of the damage doesn't doesn't really hit you I went out and looked at some of mm -hmm. it and it's like so I it's just anyway yeah we'll get together and keep good thoughts for all the people that didn't get off exactly yeah um john n whistle rarities is it uh, how, how do you pronounce that I, I, I well, okay it's ox zoomed ox zoomed volume one yeah um did you produce this album i produced the collection i produced okay. john, john oh i'll give you the the credits on there um right. i co-produced all of the studio tracks with john because that's what we always do right um but i cure and we produce the demos together anything that's on there uh we, we produce together or you know pretty close together the reason it says that i produce the collection is because i was the one responsible for trying to balance it out and get tracks from three different mediums that right. sound good together so hopefully i i did that you did a great job by the way i love the album the album's incredible oh, man good 
And the um, the cover that was you and uh, John N. Whistle's son. Is that right? Right. Well, I, well, I'll give you the whole the, okay. the whole skinny on that. When I decided to do the rarities collection, I knew I had things that no one had ever heard. I knew that I had alternate versions of this and that and the other thing, and they were credible recordings, and they should be heard, right? I mean, right. my fans. This is. Let me start it off by saying this is purely a fan driven record anything Mm -hmm. that I did on this record I did in the name of the fans because that's Mm -hmm. what John would want so I put out things that were you know a peek behind the curtain or a little bit of look at this and that and I wanted the unreleased stuff out there so I'm in constant contact with Chris we've been friends since he was 16 and um he's you know he was part of the posse that invited me to uh to send John into the suite by and by but um I called him up and I said, Chris, I'm, I'm, you know, doing a, a record, blah, blah, blah. It's rarities. And I need to come up with a clever title. And like this, he said, Oxumed. <laughs> Just like that, huh? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like John was standing there himself. Wow. I, you know, we were on the phone, but um, it was, and it, it was just so perfect. I mean, you know, it is Oxumed. It's, <laughs> uh, and I know, that that's what John would have said. So, you know, I, I, I couldn't argue. And so from that point on, once I realized that we were exhuming all old materials, you know, in the name of the ox, I started to get ideas for things to put on the cover. So yeah. we did little things in there and I call Chris up and say, you know, what, what can we put from what, you know, when he was young or things that you remember. And so we hid all kinds of stuff in there. And we used uh, Corwood, his house as the background of the back. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. It's really, the idea was to get people talking about it. Yeah. You see this and it's meant to just be fun. You know, I'm amazed how great some of these tracks are from John Enwistle. I mean, you know, his solo stuff away from the Who, because it doesn't sound like anything like the Who, which I'm glad, you know? You could even say some of these tracks to me sound like prog rock, a little bit of pro- progressive rock, right? Yeah, well, and it's interesting because that's what um, I think that's what, you know, John was a player, right? Uh, he was a composer, yes, to the 10th power, but he liked to play. And the prog stuff, the time mm-hmm. signature stuff, or the, you know, the um, cow, uh, point, that's what made us enjoy writing together. Exactly. Because he was like a drummer that had notes, and, you know, um, I guess I was like a bass player that didn't, but it was just the, it was the chemistry and, you know, I don't, not that he couldn't ever go there, but he certainly went there on this record and it was, he was, you know, first of all, we were free to do whatever we wanted to do to a certain point. We couldn't use foul language or any of that stuff because it was done. The stuff you're talking about is for the, uh, for the vampires TV show. Right. And so, and we got that show based on a demo that we did, which some of these songs were on, but we had to redo them or whatever because they weren't quite perfect for the kids. Um, <laughs> somebody, my lawyer said to somebody, Steve Longo and John Elsler are doing a kid's show. And they said, really, what are you going to do? Teach him how to drink? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was so, you know, that was the, that was the whole thing. It was to, to try to get this out there. And, you know, it's one thing led to another. That's the way it was with John. So um, the the tracks, they're very end whistle. I mean, mm-hmm. I think if you listen to those bass lines in there. and Incredible. I, yeah. And he double tracked or you know, we decided to double track one of the bass parts with an eight string. Mm-hmm. So it, it's like so heavy. It, I've never heard that sound before. Amazing. So, but he, he was fun. And at yeah. the end of his a, a endless vacation isn't on this one, but you know, the, he would just like to fool around, not fool around. He liked to be lighthearted in the studio and, mm-hmm. and laugh and have fun doing it. And we looked forward to recording. It was great. So I'm going to talk about some of the tracks. First of all, bogeyman, um, you brought in you left the Keith Moon drumming track on that on that song, which was cool. And who, who's singing you on that song? That's John. It's a demo that John I, did. It's a demo that he did for the Who, which right. 
just the, just him, the bass track and the drums and him singing and whatever, you know, and we've put in the rest of the tracks 20 years later or whatever it was. But um, and the funny part about it is you, you've heard the song, you heard the horn parts in mm -hmm. the middle. Yeah. The day that he was supposed to record those parts in the studio, he shows up to the studio and doesn't have his horns with him. So all of that stuff is done just with his like <laughs> yeah, really <laughs> i can't john. believe it <laughs> oh yeah and huh. and oh yeah it's I'm, that's john and <laughs> so when you know when we were looking for songs to do for the show we were trading demos back and forth and he played that one for me and it was like <sighs> okay. wow and it's a great wow. halloween song <laughs> yeah. you know i can't believe he had such a great voice you know it, yeah. it, who should have used them more you know on songs you know i i i would agree but um you know they when you're in a band that's that iconic there are certain stations that you know people right. occupy. daltrey's the lead singer i guess townsend would be the alternate lead singer i don't know that three lead singers of equal measure would work you know I, he certainly would have liked it, but that's yeah. what the solo band or the, the solo albums, I should say, because he wanted to do more material for himself. That's what happened to George Harrison. They kind of didn't let him in fully into the band, you know, and he had so much talent, which is a shame, you know, it was always, you know, Lennon and McCartney. Um, so many other songs. I'll try again today. Um, had a Mexican flair with uh, some hard rock guitar at the ending. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's it's uh, that's the one with the half step up. Yeah, that that was fun. The minute uh, we started doing that, I could see his mind saying, "Oh, <laughs> put a flamenco guitar. Exactly. Or, Let's get a xylophone." And it, just, <laughs> he, it was almost mischievous. What you could tell when he was struck by something because all of a sudden he'd go into that. Hmm. <laughs> uh, when you see the light cool intro uh a favorite of mine that was a favorite song i liked was that's that him singing double, again double bass. uh no that's me singing that's, that's you double, yeah that's the six uh the four and eight string bass on that one you got a great voice too Thank i mean you. so most of the uh the vocals were you and him on all these tracks or were well in you guys um, you're going to get to left for dead and that and that was um there were three vocals on there the keyboard player alan st john right uh, he's a, actually the one that brought the tune to the table you know just it was his everybody would start it and then everybody else would get in and do whatever they did right uh, and he said he had a great voice we used him um john had a solo album I guess it would be the last called The Rock. It wasn't really meant to be a solo album. It was meant to be a band, mm -hmm. but it never was 85, recorded it in 85. And we toured it actually in 88 together. This was, 85 was before me, but, um, and when we went out in 96 with that band, the Ant Whistle Band, I wanted to do the four songs that John wrote on that album, which were right. just incredible which maybe they'll be on volume two. What? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> Charlie, I'm sorry, Ben. Um, and, uh, and his voice was so incredibly perfect. And Alan St. John was the keyboard player for Billy Squire on all yeah. those songs and all that. So, um, and it was great. It, it was great. But then Alan got a gig in the off times because we were sharing John with the who. Mm -hmm. So we lost Alan and it was like, well, Johnny, you're going to have to sing a little bit. And he was like, ah, ah. <laughs> I'm not singing. <laughs> and he said, ah, they're not coming to see me sing anyway. Right. They're coming to see me. Yeah. I love the vocals on this album. I was very impressed by that. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. You I really, really liked it. You know, left for dead was kind of a, top 40 type hit it reminded me a little bit of rupert holmes and the pina colada song and had that kind of vibe to it sure. you know it had lots of bass of course and then you heard a a brief little james bond ditty in there right oh, well, did, you, did you get all of those things because yeah that was, that was so much fun yep we just uh, we um left for dead was the name of our first tour together because mm -hmm. 
were saying, well, we're left for dead. And that's why <laughs> the buzzard became our logo. John drew the buzzard and, and uh, that's, so that's his artwork. And that was kind of the running joke, left for dead, which is why when we released the, the live album, it was left for live. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, see, that's the kind of stuff he would stay up all night thinking of stuff like that. Mm. He was just, you know, brilliant that way. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, where were we going? I for- <laughs> left for dead. It, 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 very, oh, left for dead. Sorry. That could right. have been a hit back in the yeah. day. Could have been a hit. Yeah. And uh, so what we did was we decided to write three different scenarios where the the main characters left for dead. Right. So the first one, it's the spy verse, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the end of the spy verse, we play the James Bond thing. Yeah. The next one is the cowboy verse. Right. Cowboy gets robbed, and so the piece of music after that is Magnificent Seven. And then the third verse is the romantic verse where right. the wife poisons the husband, <laughs> and, the, and that long run out at the end is my wife. Really? So, oh, yeah, yeah, it's bam, no, 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 bam, 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 no, 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 with everybody just going nuts all over it. <laughs> it's just. That's a very clever song. Very clever. Yeah, we yeah. had fun with that one. It was good. Um, I wouldn't sleep with you. What a title. <laughs> and, and I that was <laughs> that was one of the songs that was on our demo. Okay. Very dark ant whistle, you know, so very typical ant whistle uh lyrics and subject matter and so on. And he brings it in. Actually, he sent me a copy of it. And I'm listening to it, and he sends me the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And we start faxing lyrics back and forth, right, just to make each other, because it's pretty it's pretty tame compared to the stuff that we were saying (laughs) back and forth. And you could never use any of that stuff on any record ever. You know, it was just way too misogynistic. (laughs) It was the end of an era, let's put it that way. And, uh, And at the end of the day, yeah. And that's a true story you know there was a girl that he was trying to hit on when he was Mm -hmm. when he was not a big rock star and then she all of a sudden said oh wait a minute i remember you (laughs) he becomes the one who got away right yeah exactly (laughs) it sounded it sounded to me very alice cooper you know that song yes yeah it's and and it's very, um, I mean, John was very, not sinister, but very, mm-hmm. you know, kind of spooky and I guess a bit sinister. Right. And, you know, his, all the stuff that he did, I love the middle eight in that song mm-hmm. um, where the guitar solo is. It's just so, the changes that he wrote are so typically classically. And yep. It's, you know, he was just, there was a, I don't, is sometimes it's not on this record is on mm-hmm. the is it on this record sometimes no uh, no it's not on here no. well hopefully no <laughs> <laughs> on the next one we're recording we're recording <laughs> that song right and the song is written and it's done i mean right. it's done and we have it locked down in rehearsal the way we're gonna record it that day john comes walking in at the beginning of the session with one of those small um you know uh, notepads for writing music music right. pads. And on it, there are eight whole note chords drawn in pencil, right? Mm-hmm. One for each bar, eight bars of music. And he said, ah, I wrote this. I woke up and wrote this down. I was like, you woke, I can't wait to hear this, right? So he sits the keyboard player down and he puts the pad in front of him. And the keyboard player plays horrible chord number one, worst chord number two, holy chord number three and we go on and I'm sitting there and I'm about to say John this sounds like crap (laughs) but I said you know better sit down and he gives everybody their parts and says to Bobby you know roll the tape and when he put his bass part on the bottom of it it was like oh god am I glad I kept my mouth shut <laughs> just but that's his genius that was yeah. his, you know to think that whole chord pattern exactly head and leave out your part in the it, yeah, so I, I I experienced some otherworldly stuff he was yep. one of a kind yep I agree 
Um, don't be a sucker. And that is another great, uh, you know, title. Um, what came to mind on this one? I don't know. I heard Steppenwolf and Mountain <laughs> on this song. It was a great song, man. What, when, when was that recorded? When was that uh, that track recorded? That was uh, in the nine. The, that was recorded in with all that stuff in the in okay the period ninety to nine uh, ninety six to ninety eight maybe ninety nine. But in that it was all in that same period, right? And all done in the same place. But it's very funny that you caught that because what we did on the when we did the vampire soundtrack was we invited friends to sing different vocals uh, you know mm-hmm. that's why I, I think billy squire sang on one and leslie west sang yep. on sucker yeah and so it was kind of it's funny that you would say that about mountain because it was absolutely once we realized he'd be the one to sing it mm-hmm. um you know we played it as if we were playing it with leslie yeah so, and he picked right up on it you know leslie's been a friend forever rest in peace but um i remember <laughs> I remember saying to him, Leslie, you need to give me a pig squeal on there. He said, God damn it, enough for a pig squeal. <laughs> it sounds like him. <laughs> that's that's actually the version that's on here is the, the version. We did the complete version of the studio. It's me singing it and Godfrey Townsend playing. Yeah. It. And yeah. then we dropped, you know, we muted those parts and Leslie dropped his stuff on. But yeah, fun song. Very. Yep. I'm friends with Corky. Corky Lane. Huh? Yeah. I just saw pictures of him and Richie Scarlett. Or they, yeah. are they, they playing yeah. together in Europe? Or are they back? Or yeah, he 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 hangs out like in in the uh, Norwegian area a lot now. I, yeah. yeah, he probably has a place out there. But I, I met him in Venice once in Venice, yeah. Florida. We had lunch together, and he's a he's a cool guy. You know, yeah. he's a nice guy. It's a good, and it's good that he's keeping you know out there still doing it. You you got to yeah. play. And that the fact that he's got Richie there, and that that whole the whole Richie connection is just right. so weird because Leslie and I were playing, and we had a we were actually using the bass player uh, and vocalist from my band from Rat Race mm-hmm. Choir, right? Dave, and when Dave when Leslie was done with Dave, he had seen Richie, and I I said I I know Richie. You know I played with Richie. We blah 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 blah. So mm-hmm. I called Richie up. Richie gets the gig with us and we toured that forever yeah and, and i left because i had tours to do and they get corky back and turn it back in the mountain so mm-hmm. what a you know what a swirl of exactly uh, but it's you know that's yep. bit- you got some live uh tracks on here trick of the light uh under a raging moon and of course shaking all over the uh johnny kid and the pirates uh cover tune where where did you play these live tunes? Where where'd you get those? They're all I believe all three of them are from the last performance in two thousand and one at BB Kings. Okay. Um I know because I digitized stuff for both volumes and some of the stuff I pulled I guess it'll be the next one, um, was from down at uh what's the Bruce Springsteen club Stone Pony. Right, right. We got some great recordings there. You know, it's it's not easy to rec- it's it, it's it's a lot easier, I should say, to get a good recording in a little place or in a small mm-hmm. venue. Because con- when you try to record in a arena, it's like yeah, forget it. And uh, and yeah, so what we've got I've got so many recordings. I'm trying to pick out the you know pick out the stuff that really is going to matter. And on on this one, I wanted to pick songs that were. You know, Chris Clark was the third keyboard player in the band or the mm-hmm. fourth keyboard player in the band. And so I wanted to give him a little space. And I found that Raging Moon, which had that beautiful piano solo in the beginning of it. And then that dreadful drum solo in the middle with the dying. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great drum solo, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Did, you know, did you catch the gag in there? There's a, there's actually supposed to be a gag and it never works on a record. Uh-huh. But, um. When I was a kid and back in the 70s, uh, I was going out with this girl who gave me a, a drumming monkey, right? You know, because right. I. And, but the thing actually kept time. It would go. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, this would be great because I play two kick drums, you know uh-huh. what I mean? 
I'll hold him up to the microphone and I'll hear That's him funny. and then I'll play along to it. And, it became <laughs> a thing. and the reason I resurrected it is because John said to me, can you make your drum solo a little longer? I said, yeah, <laughs> sure. I can make it longer. Why? Because I'd like to be able to finish a whole Winston 100. <laughs> right? So I added, I added that back in the, back in the day and it stuck. Yeah, it's funny. Not quite as impressive on a record, but yeah. Remember, uh, Summer in the City had a wind-up toy that sounded like the uh, the guys in the street. Yeah, the street yeah. organ. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hey, whatever works, you know. Exactly. Yeah. You know, Under a Raging Moon was like a little concept album in a, in a track and one song. You know, it really was yeah. very interesting song, man. Very, yeah, you know, all the different parts. It's a powerful song. And it I'll, is. You know, and it's John Parr that wrote that. Um, really? Yeah, St. Elmo's Fire, John Parr. He yeah. was the one who yeah. wrote Raging Moon. And I don't know if he wrote it for Daltrey or if Daltrey, how Daltrey came to do it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, like I said, John wanted everybody to take solos in the band. He was proud of everybody's, you know, skill sets. Yeah. And so we decided that early on and I, I thought, well, maybe, you know, do you mind doing that song and, and doing it for Mooney? Right, right. And so we did. I mean, that's, you know, and listen, I, I like to think I get paid by the note. So, <laughs> well, I gave the album five stars because oh, I, I think you. it was great. You, you, you did a great job selecting which track should be on this album and no doubt about it, you're going to do great on the next one, you know, and I'm uh, looking forward to it, man. I can't wait to share it with you. Yeah. And this is, you know, this has been, been a long time coming. Like I said, I, I think I gave everybody a, a good look at, at where we were going and yeah. where to come. Well, it's nice to hear John N. Whistle again after all these years, too. You know, he left us way too early, you know. When I read about him, though, he he didn't did he get he didn't get really checked out by the doctors real good and he could have gone through some surgery i guess to re well, repair some I, things I mean, the, the truth of the matter is i i got asked this question before and i, yeah. I i'm happy when i get asked it right because, because it's very easy to say you know john ellisle died from this that and the other thing yeah it's sensational and it's a hard rock hotel and it's the night before a tour that's right. just, you know that's like a blaze of glory which john <laughs> would have probably he would have said yeah no go with that <laughs> but the truth is he had three major blockages to right his so I, it wouldn't have been the same story if he was downstairs on the treadmill and you right. know had the heart attack there or in the middle of a bass solo that night at the show and had the heart attack there yeah uh, just happened to be you know a little bit more rock star than that exactly but, um but he didn't you know people say what killed him being John Entwistle killed yeah. every yeah. cigarette, every brandy, every fried whatever. Yep. You know, we, we dictate our lives by our choices, and those were John's choices. Yeah. He probably I, could have had stents put in, though, today. You absolutely know? could have. Yeah. But he was so scared to death. And, it, and I, I think the thing that fooled him is mm -hmm. his mother lived a very, she had heart problems. That's where really? he he got them from but yeah. she outlived him by you know leaps and bounds yeah so i think he said well as long as my mother's alive you know i'll be right. all right yeah and it was just denial it was it was more lifestyle and mm -hmm. I, you know the 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 drug thing john was a very controlled user of toys and you know extra he he was not somebody that was doing a you know, just going berserk. I'm sure there was a day, but in right. his later life, he was a sipper rather than a chugger and, mm -hmm. and he had control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, are we supposed to be doing those things at this time in our life? Probably not, but, yeah. it, and it surprised me when I heard how much people were leaning on that. Cause it's just, yeah. You know, but that's, you know, like I said, uh, I'll tell you, give you a great Ant Whistle anecdote. I'm doing a, a session. We're on a break from Ant Whistle. I'm doing a session in Woodstock, and the girl who owns the studio says, is it true that the reason John Ant Whistle and Keith Moon drink brandy is because they did a test with livers? 
Jeez. So I, you know what? I said, <laughs> I, I don't really know. I said, I'm going to call John up and ask him. I'll let you know. <laughs> so I rang John up and I said, hey, man. I said, this studio, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, no, 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 no. That's not what happened. He said they were sitting in a doctor's office in the waiting room and they were reading through the medical journals and they read that some, you know, in a controlled study, they had done tests on chicken livers to see which alcohol uh, degraded the liver the most. And the one that came out being best, the best for it was brandy. Yeah. He said, that's how we decided to drink brandy. I said, oh, okay, hmm. well, uh, I'll straighten her out then. He goes, no, 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 no. Her story's much better. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I love those great rock and roll stories. Oh, man. <laughs> and, you know, Keith Moon had a short life, but what stories he had, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and believe me, I've heard them from uh, from the horse's mouth, from yeah. the horse's mouth. And there are, some of that stuff is just, I mean, I, I can relate. I'm a drummer, but <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow. exactly. Wow, I was right. A lot of people didn't know this, and I think this is correct. Was John a Freemason? Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. You know, you sometimes you don't find out about these things till after after you know. You, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's really a cool. Very, he was a very intricate person. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think he, uh, especially when he lived in the big house down in in uh, Stow on the Wold. Right. There was there weren't people around all the time. There wasn't a party going on all the time. And so he would get into any number of things. He was a collector. He loved collecting. You know, he had collections of knights and armor and weapons and tea hmm. pots. He's the only person I know that had the whole set of Marilyn Monroe collector plates. And I said, <laughs> what's up with all this, man? Every day. <laughs> A, a yellow truck, a white truck, or a red truck would pull up and they'd drop off a you know, bunch of cartons outside the kitchen door. Right. Sitting in there and somebody would come and take them away. And one day I said, I said, what is all this? He said, ah. He said, you know, we didn't have very many presents when we were kids. Yeah. And so I see he stays up all night watching the shopping channel and just buying stuff. He bought uh, um, sheets, pillowcases, and comforters for 13 bedrooms. <laughs> Hey, why not? Whatever makes you happy, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, he was one of a kind, Ray. Yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> Very cool. I want to talk about the album you did, um, the John Andrew Whistle Band, which was a great band, by the way. It's it's it's, it's sad, isn't it? Because you guys could have, you know, really taken off with that. It was a yeah. you know. Talk talk about that album. How do you pronounce it? Is it Van Perez or what? Van Perez? The, the album oh vampires oh it's vampires why why is it look why isn't it spelled it's got like a oh there's a reason okay the reason is it was that's the the soundtrack album from the television show Vampires. Right. and what vampires are is that the show was it was a 90s show fox uh warner brothers show and um these kids four kids hang out in a junkyard, you know, that's their like their hangout. And the mm -hmm. guy who runs the junkyard is an ex roadie for the stones. That's the premise of how the thing starts. Junk, junkyard gets hit by a meteor. Okay. And all of the car, the cars turn into van hires and they suck the gas out of other cars. Wow. And the kids turn into superhero. I think they were the motivators. Motivators. Like the yeah. So it's a it's they called it anim action back in the 90s, um, half, you know, CGI and half real, um, hmm. real, you know, live acting. And it was, uh, yeah, vampires. It was great. It was it, it was really fun to do that. So they picked you guys to do the music for this. Well, for how this. it happened was I had the I had the the tracks, which now turn up on volume one right. as a demo. Right, the original way that we recorded them, original right. lyrics, this and that, and the other thing. And my business manager at the time in New York said my my his cousin was producing a a TV show, and they were looking for music. So I said, mm -hmm. well, "Send him this." Yeah, and he did, and he loved the sound of it because huh. John's whole thing is a little bit 
um it's youthful you know right it wouldn't it's not it's two degrees off of a lullaby sometimes you know what i mean and yeah and so and they they heard it right away and they Mm. called me up uh, jonathan called me up and said yeah we're gonna we're gonna go with this but we can't use these lyrics Mm -hmm. can't have any sex any drugs any weapons (laughs) no No weapons (laughs) and that's why interesting you know when we were writing left for dead which is one of the songs that's on the vampires album yeah the we had to re-record it because we couldn't use brown bread it's just left for dead now he's brown bread which is english rhyming slang for dead okay so you could, couldn't do that they said what is brown bread and i said it's english rhyming slang for dead and so we can't use that right so now so on the on the good version the pg version we had to say down in the red left mm. for dead down in the red and uh that was an interesting process so we had to rewrite all three of those verses to because we had done the music so the runouts the yeah. James bond the um western and right right life runouts were already there yeah so we had to write a you know age appropriate lyrics within those stories and that's so um, yeah. yeah very interesting i'm gonna go back and watch those uh shows oh the they, they, they were yeah. man that's the only time i voluntarily got up at eight o'clock on saturday morning <laughs> The um, John w- N. Whistle band was incredible. Of course, John N. Whistle on vocals, bass, guitar, uh, you on percussion, vocals, uh, mixing, Alan St. John, keyboard, synthesizer, backing vocals, and uh, the great Godfrey Towson, who yes. probably doesn't get enough recognition. You know, he does a lot on guitars and backing vocals. So it's that was a great band, man. But I'll tell you what, the thing about Godfrey was... Um, he fell into that that sound i mean the guy is one of the most convertible players that i know he, I he agree. can back up just about anybody and he's right. he really is a brilliant brilliant player but when he lets it rip when we're doing shaking all over or it's mm-hmm. just his whole he just drops right into that slot and it fits perfectly with what john wanted to do there was you know i i can't think of a lot of other guys that could have uh filled that spot as well as he did he was re- really a brilliant brilliant player exactly <clears throat> um i want to say i'm sorry to hear about mark hit who passed away very recently as a matter of fact uh, your, your old bandmate yeah he was in the rat race choir with you and he was in torque also yeah he was, was in torque, torque and, yeah and torque was subsequently the band that backed up leslie west and john on the uh sauce from the material world album the george harrison record um torque was the band that played it essentially uh mark and i with cliff and brian that was that's when it turned into forklift Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, that, you know, the, a combination of that band somewhere was, you know, was what I had, you know, in the off times. And, and I love that band. It was great. Mark was as good as it gets. And yeah. Talk about unsung heroes. Right. You know, that guy, he influenced so many players out there. Steve Stevens, Steve Vai, Joe mm-hmm. Satch. I mean, he was just and yeah it too soon but i think yep. i think he played all the notes that he ever would have needed to play in a lifetime in mm-hmm. 68 years and god bless him i had no idea that torque backed up george harrison on that album living in the oh, material no, world no, it was george it was a george harrison um record where we were doing george's songs oh, okay uh, the right. Entwistle band did or not the Entwistle band, John Entwistle and Torque did Here Comes the Sun. Okay. Leslie West and Torque did Old right. Brown Shoe. And then I produced uh, Mark Ford and the Sinners' I Me Mind, which is a, right. an amazing track. But no, it was it was sort of a, a tribute to George, that, that record. Yeah. And, and the weird thing about that is we did, <clears throat> we signed on to do, you know, I signed on to produce a record and guaranteed to deliver the Entwistle track. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was a long time till the thing ever came around six eight months and john had passed away mm-hmm. so it's going to be kind of tough for me to turn in that track and i think we already spent the advance so now what yeah and we had 
it's, it's too long a story to go into, but we had one recording of us doing uh, Here Comes the Sun with a walk down Abbey Road. Yeah. And we recorded it live. And I, and I said to the promoter, I need that track. He said, no one's going to sign off on giving you that track. I said, I paid just as much as everybody else did to get this thing done. Just right. to be the bass track. And he did. And I oh. built a song around John's bass track. And it was like, wow, that was... Uh, <laughs> very cool very cool what happened to the rat race choir because you guys that was way back in 68 right when you guys started in 68 that, that was a, a great time yeah. for for music god it was a great time for music i mean we were yeah. kids in 68 i was six, 16 17 right and and we actually broke uh in the 70s out of the hamptons because we got a gig out at a place called Mitty's General Store and we played every night and mm -hmm. man talk about honing your craft leaving your gear in one place set right. up a concert every night um and our sound man developed a full quadraphonic system because we never had to take it out it was and and I learned more in those summers than you could in a lifetime you know just out in the world because we were there six nights a week sometimes six nights uh, six sets on a saturday night and then do it again tomorrow for months it was like heaven years later rat race choir uh performed at in, in new york uh 2017 and i was watching some videos you guys were playing jethro tall music mm -hmm. and then you got together with the members of zebra oh, right mark and performing i performing yeah. cashmere right yeah. <laughs> Very cool. I mean, after all those years, you guys got got together again. That was cool. Well, you know, I mean, and it's funny how it goes. You know, everybody, it was 20 years since we had played together. We did one of those reunions in 97 at Speaks. Right. Um, with the Good Rats and uh, Zebra and I think Dee Snyder from Twisted and mm -hmm. um, whatever. And, and uh, then it was another 20 years just for whatever reasons that everybody you know sort of went and did their own thing and you know when we came back 2017 would have been the 49th year that the band was together my idea was guys this is zebra celebrating their 40th anniversary of coming to new york to open for us which is how it started for them and i think we should finish the album we never did that we never finished mm -hmm. write the book do do the movie whatever it is and announce yeah. that in that 2018 will be our 50th anniversary tour right well tour whatever you want i mean the you know imagine going on jimmy fallon saying oh these guys uh just got a record deal how long have you guys been together 50 years <laughs> that would be that would uh, be cool yeah, yeah it just didn't happen that way and you know like everybody doesn't see the same thing and it's not yeah. who's right or who's wrong it's you know everybody's got their own vision that's hard to do though after all these years get get back together again like that a lot of bands couldn't do that i saw the yeah boy dukes try to do that and the singer just he did blew it man he was he's terrible he's lost it of course you know nugent was great he hasn't lost a beat but the rest of the band just you know the original yeah boy dukes couldn't do it yeah, yeah i talked to um uh, Todd Rundgren too. When they Utopia got back together again too, that was interesting because a lot of their stuff was improvised, you know. Yeah, well, you know, I loved um, uh, Todd. Became a, a good friend over the years. We did that mm -hmm. tour together with you know with Ann and John and uh, Alan Parsons and so on. And Todd, man, he's you want to go on the road with somebody. That's the guy. I mean, John Entwistle, <laughs> Entwistle is the guy. But if you yeah. have to another guy, Todd's that guy. Eccentric, <laughs> funny, yep. fun, young, mm -hmm. mischievous, but, you know, but fun. just, he was a blast. And when we did those rehearsals, he had to do Bang on the Drum and he mm -hmm. had to do Hello, It's Me. Yeah. He said, well, you know, anybody have an idea for a third song? And I said, how about Open My Eyes? But, mm -hmm. You know, Naz? Yeah, exactly. Okay, that'd be great. So, wow, let's play that every night. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. He's a nice guy, really nice guy. Real Philly, Philly guy from mm -hmm. Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, you did for Forklift was an interesting project. 
And I don't know how you did that, but you got (laughs) Brian Johnson to sing. And what was going on at that time? Was ACDC in kind of limbo at the time or? It's exactly what was going on. What happened was we had another one of our famous hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So I said, we got to do a hurricane relief concert down in Jermaine Arena. I called the people at K-Rock and I called all my friends and said, guys, we got to raise some money. And the head of the radio station said, do you know Cliff Williams? And I said, no, Uh, he's the bass player from ACDC. He's a neighbor of yours. I said, okay. He said, here's his number. Give him a call and see if he'll do it. I figured, okay. I said, uh, I rang him up. I said, hey, Cliff, it's Steve Longo from the John Entwistle Band. And uh, and he said, hey, mate. And and I said, "Uh, Brad gave me your number, the guy from the radio station. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, and he said, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. I'll call Brian and we'll see what happens. So Brian came down and they played the show. And, you know, it was again, it was backing bands with, you know, the guys in front. Xander was there. Mm-hmm. The only full band was Loverboy. Loverboy's whole band, they came down and opened the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, it was great. But so that's where my friendship with Cliff began. Mm-hmm. Because drummer, bass player, okay. You know, I'm in the club. I'm not mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, and we spent started spending time together, played golf, used to go out and, and have sushi all the time. And, you know, after I got to, you know, after a few months of hanging out, I said to him, you know, Cliff, if you ever want to jam, um, my guitar player is right up in New York and he has a room in my house. Um, you know, let me know. I, mm-hmm. And I'll bring him down and we could have a good time. And he said, he said, Ma, my, my singer's in Sarasota. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Okay. And so, so we were, the plan was for us to get together. So Mark Hitt and I wrote, we call it uh, Rat Racy DC songs, mm-hmm. <laughs> because they're, they're a little bit outside of the normal, you know, one, four, five grooves that they did. Um, and Cliff was such a clever bass player. Mm-hmm. And so we, we wrote these, Mark and I wrote them in my studio. I had a demo studio in my house and in this house at the time and we brought him over to cliff and cliff said these are great and he sent him up to brian and brian said well let's get together and write some lyrics so brian and i wrote the lyrics together and you want his process you know you get to work with a guy like ant whistle and you see mm-hmm. that process that's right. an amazing process guy right. walks down at 12 o'clock with handwritten notes but johnson that's a whole it's like you when you write with him, you see right inside all of those things, back in black for those about to run. You see where mm-hmm. those lyric lines came from. He's so yeah. clever. We did a song called Blood Alley. Right. Real upbeat, like a just a, a driving song. And he calls me up um from England and he goes, Stevie, I'm dancing on the devil's head, mate. I'm dancing on the devil's head. And I said, Really? <laughs> Are you? And he's no, well, no. It's a it's a place in England, and it's called the Devil's Head, and it's given me an idea for some lyrics. Uh, and so that was the that's the song turned to Blood Alley, dancing on the Devil's Head, and it's so. I mean, there's a hundred T-shirts you could wear. For, sure, for definitely, man. He's he, just a brilliant, brilliant guy, and concerned with your opinion and i produce the tracks and you know mm-hmm. how's that scanning for you me son I, that's great man oh okay you do some great impressions by the way <laughs> <laughs> that was just like you man <laughs> no we did we did something that we we i was playing <laughs> i was playing with uh robin cheap trick had just done a uh, a show downstairs at ruth eckerd hall and torque was up right. and so rick and and uh and robin and um oh come on help me now the bass player uh, tom <laughs> uh, and bunny had left so yeah. we did their set you know we did a set upstairs with them and the guy comes up to me and he says can you get brian johnson on the phone and i said what he said call brian johnson up he's drunk to the wind call brian johnson up and get him to say hello to everybody on the phone i said I, I can't do that. How, how can I do that? <laughs> and so, okay, you can do it. Yeah, he loves you. So I I get a, a 58, right, a microphone, mm-hmm. and I bend down, and I pretend to be talking on the phone, and I go, 
Hey, Brian, it's Steve. Oh, hello, my son. How's it going? And I do, <laughs> do this thing back and forth, right? And everybody in the house is laughing because they don't really know what's going on. And the guy comes up to me and he goes, how did you do that? I said, it was me. <laughs> I know, but how did you do that? I said, well, well I, I was doing it. It was me. I was doing it. I know, but how? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, I've, inter I've interviewed thousands of people all over the world well, and I, I still haven't have. interviewed Brian Johnson who lives probably 20 minutes from me <laughs> you, know, you know he is um when we did that tour we because we did it once we we wrote the songs we wanted to go out and play them and we did a tour yeah. you know and he is is so funny and when he does an interview I mean he says stuff that you won't that you just wouldn't expect to hear out of somebody's mouth. <laughs> Some little kids coming up to get his autograph, a young person, I should mm -hmm. say, little kid, and he goes, oh, come on, me son, don't be shy. Your mother wasn't. <laughs> That's great. He was great. He you was see his car collection? Oh, yeah, I, I yeah. bought one of his cars. I bought his Aston Martin. Oh, really? Very cool. Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you, that story's great. We're hanging mm -hmm. out and we're writing the songs for the sessions, right? And I'm up in Bird Key a couple of days staying at mm -hmm. his house. And I was getting ready to buy, I wanted to buy a Jaguar XKR. That was about the only new car that was around that looked like it could be a daily driver, but still was exotic enough. And Brian's a race car driver. And I said to him, Brian, what do you think about, you know, I I'm thinking about getting an XKR. I said, come on me soon. And he takes me down into the garage and, and there it is. And he goes, this is what that's pretending to be. <laughs> So he said, take it home. I'm going out to town. Take it home. Leave your car here. Right. Don't like it. Bring it back. Huh. And it was, if you don't like it, let's take a freaking Aston Martin home. And so I bought it from him, cash. I, I said, done, man. This is like. You still have it? Do I know? I, no, I, I got rid of it <laughs> um, not that long ago. It was just sitting around and they, you know, it was a 98. And if you right. don't stay on top of them boy they really can fall apart and i didn't want that to happen to mine so i just let yeah. it go. yeah i got i did I, we cleaned out the sports cars a few years ago i'm not saying i wouldn't do it again but mm -hmm. it's, you know this i don't know if i don't want to go electric it's you know yeah. just simpler uh, but it was a great car i had it for forever i had it longer than you should have it and still have it be you know uh of any value great car beautiful i love sports cars but it's I got long legs, so it's very hard for me to get in and out of. You know, yeah. I I had a Corvette that I finally gave to my son because I hurt my Here. back, and it was a '97, I think. Oh, okay, yeah, newer one, Con convertible. Mm -hmm. I, wa yeah. I wanted a '63, but I couldn't find oh. one at the time. Yeah, so did I. <laughs> everybody wanted a '63. Uh, beautiful. Uh, I had a '70 that yeah, uh, yeah. That I loved. It was my my first real. You know, I, I had Camaros and and uh, Barracudas and stuff, but uh, but that was my my first real love affair with a car. The new vet is gorgeous. Oh man, the yeah, the twenty three. Why I, don't you buy one? Buy one of those. I'm thinking about it. I, yeah. I, I we saw one on the street the other day. Yeah, you know, you know what drives around down here. Yeah, and I said to my wife, you know, I said I might be able to get next to that again. I mean, plus yeah. the fact think about it my my aston martin when it was new was like a hundred and eighty thousand dollars or something mm -hmm. like that if you spend a hundred and eighty thousand dollars on a new corvette you'd have the most tricked out corvette there yeah. but then my wife said and that's why everybody will have one mm -hmm. so you know i don't want to do that either yeah i, I, I had a 79 trans am oh you know i had put headers on it and it was very very cool and louvers in the back one of 400 yeah yeah one of the original wow oh, man yeah we it, the funniest thing about rat race choir is we all bought sports cars about the same <laughs> time i think i got in with the first i was the corvette then mark and dave both bought pontiacs one bought the trans am the other mm -hmm. bought the formula 400 larry the keyboard player stuck with his pinto but that was <laughs> That's funny. So we would we would all drive to work because I'm not I'm not riding with you. I'm not riding with you. And we all had CB radios. And yep. I was like, hey, Breaker, good buddy. That's I, right. Me too. I had one. Going down the, you know, like a freaking caravan. Yeah. 
Fun Those times. were fun. Great times, yeah. A break of one nine, break of one nine. <laughs> yeah, hey, good buddy. Yeah, you, you got the old sock cooker here coming it, at it, you. It, bye, yeah. Bye, bye. yeah, I was the. Uh, I think I called myself Super Tramp. Super, Super Tramp. Tramp. Uh-huh. Yeah. The truckers made fun of me though. <laughs> oh, should have called yourself Lot Lizard. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, we're going to bring in this other guy now into the show. His name is Steve Luongo. Oh, is he coming in? He's coming in now. He's an artist and a fashion designer. Yeah. I love the shirts, by the way. I'm surprised you're not wearing one on the show. <laughs> you know what? It, 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 this has always been my uniform forever. Um, yeah, me too. And, and I just, I don't know. I, I, the thing with the shirts is that's such a strange story, how that came about. Um, my grandfather was self-made man was right. in the garment district he, in the garment industry they you know back in the 30s and 40s or whatever mm-hmm. it was he had a factory that made this and that and the other thing so i grew up with that stuff fashion stuff all around me and the only right. thing that i cared about it was like stage clothes i don't want to do it i don't want to do it. and so i repelled it for all those years but i've been an artist since as long as i've been playing music always either with a scissors or a a crayon mm-hmm. or whatever, but always making art. And over the years and decades of doing it, you know, just to come down, relaxing from the studio, um, I guess I developed a style. And I'm doing a fundraiser one day, and a, the guy who I'm doing it with is looking through my pictures because we're trying to get some stuff for the paper. And he says, uh, what is that piece of my art pops up? What is that? I said, ah, it's nothing. It's my art. And picture, 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 another piece pops up. He goes, wait a minute, hold it. What is that? I said, it's my art. He said, have you ever shown it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I said, my wife has seen it. My mother's seen it. He said, no, I don't mean that in a gallery. I said, no. He said, well, I'd, I'd like to put some at the fundraiser and see if we could sell it. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want somebody buying something of mine because they're, you know, contributing to a good cause. Right. He said, well, don't sign it. And we won't say who it is. Mm -hmm. We sold every piece and I signed them at the end. So then he says, oh, now we got to do this. And and so long story short, he signs, gets me signed up to the Naples Art Association and I'm being invited to do all these shows. And it's like, it's like a dog person at a cat show. You know, I'm a musician. Art people are very, you know, they know their stuff. And I felt like a fish out of water, but I'm doing all these, you know, gallery shows and I'm doing these exhibits. And I sold incredibly well, almost to the point of guilt, right? Because I mean, these people are struggling their whole lives. I come down and it's like, oh, okay. So at one of my shows, somebody came, the, the big thing is people would come in, to, come to my section and, and they'd be joking because they wouldn't know who I was. And they'd say, oh man, uh, this looks like something I would have enjoyed when I was in college, you know? <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a good endorsement. So, yeah. um, and then somebody came, it was actually Paul, the guy who got me into it, said, you know, this would look great on shirts. And I said, eh. and he's thinking t-shirts with the, right. You know. And right. so over the years, I developed the thing with the signature on the buttons and the limited edition, because there's there, it's a full piece of art. If you took a 40 by 60 canvas, right, and cut it up and made a shirt out of it. That's what this is. I- and, What's the process? Because it's very cool. I mean, they're beautiful shirts, but how do you manufacture these these things? I mean, oh, well, I I basically I take the piece the piece of art that's going to be dedicated to it, right? And I send it down to the factory. I, I, we manufacture in uh, Modinagar in India, and they print out just like they're printing a canvas. Only they okay. print it out of you know double weave cotton, which right? Is like you know thousand thread count sheets and they they print it out and then they just cut the parts and put it together so each piece Mm -hmm. is a unique representation of the art it's like a walking the artist print it's signed on the inside in it's the signature is embroidered on the inside there's a number uh, it's a number of 20 one of 20 20 of 20 and that's it for like there's 20 mediums and 20 largest Mm -hmm. so there's a hundred from mm-hmm. small to two X of each style and they're named and there's little things embroidered on them. And y- you know, Robert Graham, do you know, Robert Graham, the, uh, the designer? The yeah, designer. sure. I didn't want to 
you know, I took a lead from from him because mm -hmm. there, uh, Robert Stock is actually the designer. Okay. And I had a meeting with them about my shirts, but they didn't they didn't sign on. Um, and so I took leads from them, like the signature embroidered on the buttons. I want nobody. They didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do something different. And we did the there's a whole bunch of little fun things to discover uh, on the shirts. And, you know, there there are this first line is almost completely sold out there. Were, there was only ever a thousand shirts and they're mm -hmm. very expensive, but it's a piece of art and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's and I've got I'm so proud everybody from Billy Dean country star to uh, Buck Dharma to uh, uh, Stanley Sheldon was wearing one the other night. It's, uh, you know, Eddie money. Mm -hmm. Eddie is the one who was the first one to wear them. If yeah. You, if you, I, he's so he's such a great guy. Rest in peace. I miss yeah. him to this day. I tell you a funny Eddie story. Um, I have a pattern that I want to do a shirt out of right and I want to do it big, but they print it wrong. They print it like they repeat it in little squares. Okay. But it it's it's the one called vines if you ever mm -hmm. happen to see it. Um, and it's the only one that repeats like it has a mm -hmm. pattern. The reason is, when I got the mistake, I was doing the samples in China first, when I got mm -hmm. the mistake back from China, I said, I, this is not what we're doing. And I said, Eddie, you want Find a new shirt for stage. And he said, Yeah, Stevie, send them all out. So I sent it out to him, and he winds up wearing it on his television show. Uh, um, what the hell's the name of his show? Um, on, on Access TV. Okay. Uh, something money. Mm -hmm. Big money, easy money. I, I right, right, right. Um, and he wears it on the very first episode. He goes, Well, I love this shirt. What's happening with my hair? And it's like, <laughs> Now I got to make the shirt that way. <laughs> I, I did. I did. Very cool. I love uh, the shirts, man. Thank you. Um, thank not only that, you've got designer pillows, which are very, very cool. Yeah, yeah. They what we man, I met this fabulous artist up in your area um, from the boutique pillow, and she said, mm -hmm. you know, we ought to get uh down inserts and stuff these mm -hmm. things and you know and she did all the covers and it's amazing and for me you know i i so now instead of hanging out at art galleries i'm hanging out in in uh, whatever they are furniture stores <laughs> and and it's and she put like one piece of art on one side and a different piece of art on the other side and we were calling it embraceable art and they're saying well with the open floor plans nobody has you know wall space for art anymore so this is perfect exactly and, and yeah. it was, it's great i mean you know there i don't get to do as many of them as i'd like and they mm -hmm. sold really well so there's yeah. only a couple more hanging out but it's I never expected it to go the way it went. I certainly never expected Amazing. to have a shirt on stage at Madison Square Garden every month with Billy Joel's band. It was like it's it's amazing. Like, Come on, man. Well, but, what's yeah. what's up with the uh, Roy Orbison experience? The T-shirt. That's uh, that's very cool thing. Yeah, uh, I have a friend who I've been been a friend of mine. In fact, going all the way back to the dog story, right? Okay. The dog that had to come down here to keep swimming. Right. This is the guy who told me if he keeps swimming, he'll walk to his last day. And that was, you know, I've known Bruce for decades. Mm -hmm. And he's a vet by trade. And, and he was, you know, been our vet. I, and he, we still consult with him down here. And he's been just a, a great, great friend anyway. I said to him, you know, if you ever want to come over to the studio and record, he said, you know, I'm a guitar player. I said, oh, if you ever want to come over and record, you could have some fun. So one thing led to another. He was coming mm -hmm. by once a week. We'd put some tracks down. He'd do this. He'd do that. And one day he started bringing in original material and he starts singing. And my wife is going by the control room and she says, that sounds like Roy Orbison. And it was like, boing, it does. It sounds just like Roy Orbison. And I said, Bruce, you ought to consider blah, 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 blah. Well, 20 years later, we finally find a combination of guys that are, you know, that know the stuff, you know, the original uh, material that Roy did. And there's a whole story, a whole backstory. I could probably tell you uh, things in two minutes that you would have never known about Roy. Um, did you know that he married his first wife, divorced her and remarried her again? No. Didn't know that. And then she was killed in a, uh, on a motorcycle. 
Uh, I know the, he's had a lot of tragedies in his family. Man, I know that. But yeah. he's had so many triumphs. So I said, yeah. if we do this thing, let's, you know, I'm always the one who wants, I'm the, you know, the, I say, if you want to get in the room, everybody's lined up at the door going through the window. So um, I had this idea, let's do a live documentary. Mm -hmm. Let's do screens and footage mm -hmm. and narration. But, you know, and explanations of the music. So, right. so that's what it is. It's, it's, um, it's the Roy Orbison experience. And these guys go out and they do that show and, the, you know, the big HD screens with all this, you know, it's gold records and all the things, the triumphs and the tragedies. It's, and it was amazing. It took me about a year hmm. to put it together, but it's just, I'm very proud of that. It's, it's, sure. uh, yeah, it's really, it's really neat. And, and the guys just, do a great job. Keith Crane is my musical director and Bruce Bumstead is the principal singing the Royce. Yeah. Song. Right. Awesome. If my wife would let me, I'm a big Telecaster fan. I, 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 I sold my telly. It had a lot of autographs on it and I got a lot of money for it. It was a 73, but the <sighs> big bang Telecaster on your website. Whoa. Oh, is, this, this, is it a tell? Uh, oh yeah. That's, um, is it hey, still for sale? We could. Well, the number two is okay. that, that was number one. There's only ten of them, and you uh, painted that, right? Well, I, it's my art that a, a very, very mm. talented luthier did. He put the guitar together. It's beautiful. A, if, if you want one, I, I'll I'll make sure that I get it for you. Uh, it'll it'll be number two. That was number right. one. But yeah, if you really wanted one, man, I, I would have him. He is a an excellent artist. Um, uh, yeah, so Mr. R's guitars, uh, but yeah, that's my gorgeous. art. Uh, you remember, if you're a Telly fan, you remember yeah. the Telly Strat and Bay and the P bass, right? The mm -hmm. pink. And, well, that's uh, it's a photograph that, and it's laminated into, mm -hmm. it. and uh, this guy knows how to do that process, and he did it. That guitar is stunning. Yeah, it is stunning. stunning. I've never seen anything like that. If you want, if, I, I would absolutely have him do number two okay. for you. I'll, see, I'll work on my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Got to clear everything through her first. I, listen, you know, I, understand, <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, I understand that. But yeah, shout out to Mr. R's guitars. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, craftsman. But yeah, now, the oh, color yeah. of rhythm. That's a book. Is, is that a? That's your book, right? It's a book of yeah. It's it's a, a coffee table book of my art. Yeah, because it was the name of when I was doing the um, gallery circuit. It was the name of the show. Right. Um, because for me, the art, it's very rhythmic. I mean, mm -hmm. it's almost like composing music when I do it, and it gives me that same kind of piece. So uh, the the owner of the gallery, it was Paul Fisher Gallery in Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, um, said, you know, we need to come up with a title for the show. And I right. thought, okay, Color of Rhythm. And yeah. it stuck and it, you know, so I, that's what it is. It's the Color of Rhythm. Color of rhythm. It's like visual music for me. So that's, yeah, yeah. That's what that, that is. Is that available on Amazon or should they? I think that, it? I think they sold that edition out and I need to yeah. do either another edition. I don't think you can still get it. I did see a sold out somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm going to, I, I certainly, I'm sure I have a copy around here somewhere. I right. yeah, send it to you. Very um, cool. Yeah, you know, we can, we can work it out. I would love to be in your archive. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can, uh, we can trade books. <laughs> there you go. The Rockstar Chronicles. And I've also got uh, a story about me growing up in the family business, which I'm pitching for a sitcom right now. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking to producers and all that good stuff. Very different. We have to stay busy. I, 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 um, I've been doing screenplays and stuff like that. Really? You, know, you have a lot of time when you're on the road. You, you've got yeah. you know, 20 hours in the day where you're just kind of not doing a lot. And I love to write stories and, you know, uh, so I've been doing that for years and years. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm starting a book about this thing. And then it turns into another book about that thing. And it's like <laughs> man, too much stuff. You'd be great at um, writing a book on fiction, you know? You know, I think people think I already am writing a book. On 
<laughs> stuff that's happened to me in my life. Yeah. I, you know, God, I, you know, it's it's been un, what an unbelievable ride. And everybody says, oh, you should write a book. You should write a book. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'd like I've been writing the stories down. But yeah, I should try to, you know, come up with a way of presenting it because there's some yeah. there's just some funny things that, you know, things that you would never get to hear if, you know, you didn't hear them from the inside. And especially with John, they, yep. he was, he was so funny. We, we just had such a great time. Yeah. Very blessed to, to have, uh, had the opportunity, not just to play with the guy, but to really be, you know, right. friends. And, you know, there was never any hierarchy, you know, he, mm -hmm. he never played the rock star card. He was just, I yeah. think that's what drove our friendship. We were just friends for being friends yep. it wasn't because he was in the who, and I wanted to, you know, it wasn't that at all. They used to say the same thing about George Harrison. A lot of people I knew, I talked to Gary Wright, who was really good friends with George Harrison, and he never wanted to bring up the Beatles. He didn't, you know. No, I remember yeah. when we, we started doing the press for the for the Entwistle tours. Yeah. Guys would always say, you know, are you in touch with the guys in the Who? And he'd say, only through a medium. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. All right, here's your final question. Okay. I ask everybody this question. I get some very interesting answers. If you had a Field of Dreams wish, like the movie, to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? No. You can't say John Anwistle. Well, I, it, it would be Hendrix. There's no... no okay, point. cool. Uh, um, it would absolutely be Hendrix, but I think it would have to be Entwistle on bass, but we're not going there. <laughs> Um, and I've thought about that many times. Uh, I've thought about that, you know, what would that have been like? Because I, Hendrix, you know, I, I'm a pre-Beatles guy. So I, mm -hmm. I was actually in a band, you know, as a little, little kid before right. the Beatles. And so I went through the change of black and white to color. But um, I, I've thought about that, man. What? Wow. That would be, yeah, Hendrix. Hendrix shaped a great deal of my production the way i i produce records which i guess actually would be eddie kramer but um writing i he was one of the heaviest influences so it would have to be jimmy hendrix yep very good answer well i want to say special thanks to hadley wolfram of chipster pr i've worked with uh chipster pr for years and years now for arranging this interview with steve longo you can purchase the new release by John N. Whistle, Rarities Oxumed, Volume 1, and that's available now. Is it is available now? It is available now, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it is yeah. available now. JohnNWhistle.com. Right. JohnNWhistle.com, probably on Amazon as well, I think. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. it's yeah, they, they, the, the label, Deco and Warner Brothers have done such an amazing job yep. getting this out there. I would think that, you know, you could probably get it uh, just about anywhere. I know it's everywhere. In, uh, what's the book, um, Barnes and Noble? And, yep. uh, you know, it's, it, it's there. John N. Whistle, an Ox's Tale, the John N. Whistle story, the documentary. Um, that's available. You can buy it on DVD or you can just watch it on Amazon Prime. On Amazon or Hulu or, yeah, that was, you know, and I started that movie when John was alive. Huh. The idea of that, um, the idea for that, um, I knew a filmmaker, mm -hmm. uh, actually son of, of uh, Kreutzmann, Bill Kreutzmann from the dead, Justin Kreutzmann. Right. He went to England. I said, John, let's do a documentary about, you know, what it's like to, you know, dust off the old rifle and go back out to war, you know. Uh, he's, his process of preparing for a tour was very unique. And I thought it would be cool to document it. So we sat around doing, you know, films of this and that and the other thing. And it never, never came together. Mm -hmm. um, you know how that goes, right? The yeah. Goes, yeah. But I had the 10 hours in the can. And then when John passed, and it was John that named it, because I was mm -hmm. doing it. I was editing the initial cut. And I said, what should we call it? And just like Christopher, he went, an ox's tail. <laughs> <laughs> you guys come up with this <laughs> but uh yeah i mean there's this you've got to be in the genes i'm and telling you it was perfect an ox's tail t-a-l-e mm -hmm. perfect um and so i kept the name and finished it you know posthumously 
years and years later and Pete was kind enough to be in it and if you mm -hmm. if you see it and you see there's I think we used about 12 minutes of me and Pete mm -hmm. talking in at Pete's studio mm -hmm. and we sat there and talked for three and a half hours wow. that interview was it wasn't even an interview it was like this it was just guys talking back yeah. and forth and he was telling me all about that was amazing it was a uh, uh, three and a half hours i'll never forget i saw a lot of that on youtube the interview yeah, with the, the, the director yeah. yeah i edited i edited yeah. um a 15 minute piece of that um and man just you know what a good guy i mean you know yeah it was very generous of him to uh you know to take that much time sure. out and, and uh, and he did a great it was there were great stories I and mean, the stuff that he told was just mm -hmm. It was so good. In fact, I got a call from the director of Amazing Journey, right, which is the big, mm. uh, asking me if they could license some of my footage. <laughs> really? So, yeah. When you see the Pete stuff in Amazing Journey, you'll see the yeah. Rickenbacker in the background. That's yeah. my footage. <laughs> you know, there's another side to your business that you could probably excel at it, and that's being a director in film. I could see you doing that. I would love to do that. Yeah. I directed the videos. If you saw the videos, I did direct the the music videos, the two music videos that we did. Yeah. And You're man, good at that. That's, that's fun. That's fun. You look like a director. <laughs> <laughs> a clapboard, right? Exactly. Um, I just want to mention also, um, Peter Frampton is also in that film, right? He doesn't he narrate some of that? Or, yeah, narrate. Well, they were, you know, he played on one of John's solo albums. Right. Peter used to open for the Who. I think Mooney. There's a story about Mooney chaining Frampton to a heat, you know, a, a, a radiator in a dressing room, and they're announcing him, and he can't get out. That's <laughs> they, funny. They tortured poor Frampton. <laughs> No, he did a great job. He's a good guy, Peter. Yeah. I want to say for more information about Steve Longo, visit www.stevelongo.com. You're also on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you can go to johnnwhistle.com. That's his official site. And also decoentertainment.com as well. Yeah. And, and let me shout out everybody at Deco. Mm -hmm. They have just done a fantastic job with this release, and I, I, yep. I couldn't be more proud, and I'm pretty sure John would be very proud. Oh, I think so. It's great. Five stars all the way. I love it. Thank you, Thank you for bringing that to us. We, My pleasure. To be continued, I promise. To be continued. <laughs> Steve, thank you, man, so much for being on the show today. It's been a pleasure talking to another Floridian. And uh, if you're ever in this area, give me a call or contact me. and. You yeah, go out for a beer or coffee or whatever. And thanks for having me, Ray. This is a sure. great show, and um, I, you know, I look forward to doing a follow up or whatever. Sure. We can. So we'll stay in touch. We're neighbors. We got exactly. It. I appreciate it, man. Thanks I, again. I, thank you. All right, man. Take care. Take care. See you. Bye bye now.